When you think of an elemental in D&D, what comes to mind? Probably not vast, organized kingdoms of sentient beings serving lords and ladies in ancient primordials. Today, we're gonna hopefully change how we might look at the elemental creatures of earth, fire, air, and water, and we're gonna start by going back to fourth edition. Welcome to Monster of the Week. Today is a really special episode that I've kind of been thinking about for quite some time now. I do think this episode is going to end up quite long though, so get comfy, grab your favorite dwarven ale, and get ready for a trip back to the elemental chaos of 4th edition. Usually elementals just appear as these kind of monstrous living manifestation of that type of element. You wouldn't expect to see a fire elemental donning armor and commanding an army. But that is the topic of today's videos, the elemental archons. So if you watched my video about 4th edition angels, you're probably familiar with the concept of the Dawn War already, but if you haven't, I'll give you a quick little crash course here. Basically, in 4th edition, there was this idea being pushed of the Dawn War, which was this crazy battle that happened between the gods and the primordials. Angels and elemental clashing for dominion over all of the planes and existence itself. So like I said, I did a video about angels in the past, and this video is about the Archons, which were kind of the elemental equivalent. The whole story is that the elementals were losing the Dawn War. And as much as they could muster powerful creatures born from the elements themselves, they didn't have organization. They didn't have that same army and discipline that the angels had. So their answer to this problem was to create the Archons which were still elemental beings, but they donned armor, had a hierarchy, had intelligence, had roles, and basically lived to fight this war. Of course, as the war ended, the elementals found their place in the elemental planes and pretty much nowhere else as the gods took dominion, the archons were just kind of there. Some of them went rogue and started mercenary bands, Others just kind of aimlessly roam the chaos and destroy any non-elemental that enters their domain. Yet the vast majority of these Archons found purpose in serving the primal lords by which they were created. One thing I do find really funny is that these Archons are kind of scattered across a bunch of different books, and they're not really in any order that necessarily makes sense. In classic 4th edition fashion, there are a ton of different types of Archons, of course there's one for each classic element but you've also got para-elemental archons and all kinds of stuff going on. Today, we're just gonna be talking about the archons of elemental fire, earth, water, and air, but if you guys are interested in this video, maybe we'll do a part two about the para-elemental archons. As far as tracking these elementals down goes, in the first monster manual, they give us fire archons and ice archons. In the monster manual two, we get water archons, earth archons, and storm archons. In the manual of the planes, we get air archons, and in another supplement called the plane below, we get iron archons and mud archons. So like I said, today we're just gonna be talking about fire, earth, air, and water, but maybe we will do a second episode about ice, mud, storm, and iron archons. So just to kind of lay out how these things are, so just to kind of lay out how the archons are presented in the book, each archon type has three different kinds of archons within it. So there are three fire archons, three water archons, three earth archons, you get it. Usually they consist of one kind of just basic melee unit, a commander of some kind, like an elite unit, and some kind of uh, caster who's there for backline support. The only exception to this rule is the air archons actually. There are only two of those, but we'll get to that in a minute. Basically what we're gonna do is go through each type of elemental archon, talk about what unique abilities they possess, and then we'll go over some plot hooks as how you might use Archons in your game. So first up from the Monster Manual 1, we've got the Fire Archon. These Archons, as you might expect, much like Fire Elementals, are extremely combat centric. I mean, they're all really built for combat, but Fire Archons are just all about pure raw damage. First in this line of Archons, we have the Ember Guard. They wield giant black iron axes and as you'd expect, cause massive fire damage when they connect. The biggest differentiating factor between these Archons and just regular elementals, at least visually, is the fact that Archons wear armor. These guys wear full plate and they are not messing around. To command these Archons, we have the Blaze Steel Archons. They are the elite forces that do wield scimitars. In addition to dealing fire damage, of course, they actually explode upon death. So if your party manages to take one of these guys down, it's going to do fire damage to everything around it. They also have this neat ability that whenever they have combat advantage, they actually do an additional amount of fire damage on top of what they already do. So again, the theme with fire elemental archons is clearly just doing as much damage as possible. Thirdly, we have the Ash Disciple. The Ash Disciple is basically the fire archon version of the combat caster. To help them stay mobile, they can teleport within 15 feet of any fire source, 
that can include other fire archons, so they're great at just jumping around the battlefield whenever they're needed. They have an ability called Rain of Fire that can target a big group of enemies and not only does damage, but actually sets them on fire if they fail their save. As you'd expect, they have many different spell-like abilities that do fire damage, such as Flame Wave, which creates literally a moving wall of fire. Then if the target fails its save, they get moved back 10 feet and also catch on fire. They also have another ability that's basically just fireball, and if the target fails at save, they catch on fire. And as the fire elemental theme goes of burning up their own energy to do extra damage, they can choose to sacrifice all the remaining hit points to do massive area of effect damage surrounded on themselves. This does also happen automatically when they're reduced to zero hit points, but they can trigger it prematurely if they so choose. And the more hit points they have remaining when they do this, the more damage is actually caused. So as you can see, in a typical Elemental Archon army, the Fire Elementals are going to be up front, causing just crazy amounts of damage. Moving on to the Monster Manual 2, though, in 4th edition, we've got Water Archons. These guys are a lot less focused on dealing direct damage and a lot more focused on controlling the battlefield. Many of their abilities focused around being extremely mobile in combat, maneuvering around enemies, and ultimately exploiting the positions of their foes. The first part of the trinity here is the Shoal Reaver. Rather than a spear or mace, they wield a trident so they can get some extra range on their enemies. And they also have a harpoon so they can stab at enemies and drag them closer. In addition to this, they have a whirlpool ability that functions very similarly to the spell Everett's Black Tentacles. If you're not sure what Everett's Black Tentacles is, basically it creates an area that slows down movement. Not only that though, but it also causes damage over time to anyone stuck within that area. Now of course this doesn't create tentacles, but instead summons a whirlpool on a small amount of water on the ground that drags creatures to the floor. So their movement is going to be slowed and it actually has a chance to knock them down as well. Next after that we've got the Tide Strider. These guys are the elite forces of the Water Archons and they have a Great Spear over just a regular trident. As you'd expect the Great Spear does a great deal amount of more damage but these guys can also weave through combat at ease. They can move up to 30 feet away from their current position effectively teleporting as they move by in water form without taking any attack of opportunity. However, during this move, they can also make a great spear attack against one enemy along the way. And if they happen to have advantage on any attack they make, they also knock the target prone if they connect with them, assuming the target fails their save, of course. And third on our list here is the Wave Shaper. These guys, again, are the casters of the Water Archons and are meant to stay kind of in the back line. They have several different water spells that mostly focus on knocking people prone and slowing their targets. However, they also have one spell that allows them to take away reactions from their target as well. They don't do a ton of damage, but their main focus is just kind of on slowing down the enemy's forces. They do also grant extra movement to any creatures within 30 feet of themselves, so if another Water Archon, such as the Tide Strider, starts close to the Wave Shaper, it gets to move incredibly far and incredibly fast. And as is often the trope with many water creatures, they also have some healing spells. In fact, any water creatures that start within 10 feet of the Wave Shaper just heal 10 hit points off the bat. Also in the Monster Manual 2, we will find the Earth Archons. As you would expect, they are extremely defense oriented. The first one up is called the Seismic Striker. These guys are just the bulk force of the Earth Elemental Armies and they wield war picks. They can also chuck stone javelins if they need to just get that ranged attack in. However, the ability they're going to want to use most is the Earth Stomp ability. This has a chance to knock enemies prone and it also does a decent amount of damage. However, if the enemy's already prone, rather than knocking them prone again, which is not something you can do in D&D, they just deal extra damage. They also have a advantage against any creatures they make an attack of opportunity against, and if they hit a creature running by with an attack of opportunity, that creature's movement ends right there. They're meant to just be the front line and lock down the opponents. After that, we've got the Ground Rager. These guys don't actually wield the weapon and just rely on their slam attacks if it comes down to melee. However, they're pretty much never going to engage in melee. They are the commander unit of the Earth Archon forces and they want to stay close to the back. Probably starting to see a theme here. They have an ability where an aura all around them at about 25 feet, the ground starts to turn to mud. If any creature stops and doesn't move on its next turn within that area, it becomes immobilized. Most of its abilities are area of effect attacks that only affect targets that are on the ground, like earthquakes and that sort of thing. And the going theme here as well is almost all of its powers knock targets prone. Lastly, we've got the Rumbler, which is sort of the elite skirmishing unit of the Earth Archon army. They wield a Warhammer and they excel at taking on groups of enemies. They have an attack called Thundering Might, which targets all creatures around them and does a fair amount of damage. However, it does even more thunder damage if there's more than two creatures adjacent to them. Basically, these guys are designed to route the enemy from behind. 
knock everyone prone who's trying to get away, and just cause massive damage to anyone who might already be knocked prone. Literally, the more enemies around this guy, the more damage he causes. And lastly, in the obscure manual of the planes from 4th edition, we've got the Air Archons. The Air Archons are possibly the highest level and most powerful of the Archons, but there are only two of them. Why they chose to only make two types of these guys and three of all the others, I'm not sure, but this is what we've got. The Air Archons overall are kind of designed to be skirmishers. They employ a lot of hit and run tactics. And unlike the other Archons, they can actually fly, which is a huge benefit. So first up, we've got the Zephyr Haunt. These guys are the foot soldiers who wield massive spiked flails. Their flails not only cause physical damage, but also lightning damage, and they can hook people and try to pull them in a little bit closer. Not quite as much as the Harpoon from the Water Archons, but about 5 feet. The Zephyr Haunt can also use its move action to push all creatures surrounding it back 5 feet and teleport itself 40 feet. This is kind of an escape maneuver, but this is why I say hit and run tactics. They get in, do as much damage as they can, when things start to look bad, they push everyone back and teleport out. And this ability works very well in conjunction with the other Aircon, the Tempest Blade. Tempest Blades are kind of the casters of the two and don't really want to be touched by anyone. To achieve this, they can create a small storm around themselves in a 15 foot radius. The blowing winds are so intense that any creatures in this area are deafened until they leave the area. They also have disadvantage on reflex saves, which is very important and you'll see why in a second. Up close and personal, the Tempest Blade wields a longsword, which not only does physical damage, but lays on lightning damage. And they can cast an ability called Bonds of Wind that essentially encases a creature in wind elemental energy and prevents it from moving and is effectively removed from the fight until it can succeed on its dexterity save. However, these creatures do want to constantly be on the move. They have a 40 foot move speed, and as long as it moves that full speed on its turn, its lightning attacks actually do more damage, and it can impose disadvantage on the first attack made against it. So all of the Archons have this kind of militaristic attitude that has just been ingrained in them from creation. Each type of Archon definitely has some very strong strengths, but also some pretty obvious glaring weaknesses. Because of this, Archons often fight together. They are united in their cause to take back the elemental planes and destroy the gods. Now, it may be a little too late for that since the gods have kind of already won, but nonetheless, united they stand. As far as using these creatures in your game, you could, like I said, set them up as kind of a rogue mercenary band left over from the last war, or however you have that spun in your campaign. A collection of elemental archons could make a really neat encounter, especially if you've got some different types mixed in there, and you could even have them led by some sort of very powerful elemental that's the boss encounter. Or if you want to actually go down the route where you have these elemental kingdoms that are a lot more organized than we would typically be used to, Elemental Archons are ideal for just town guards and basically the army that makes up the military force of that kingdom. At the end of the day, most of these Archons, save for the commanding units, aren't capable of any really insane over-the-top flashy moves, but that's kind of what makes them cool, is they're basically just the militia of the elemental forces. And ultimately, if you're running a campaign that takes place in some of the other planes or just is very focused around the idea of elementals, it gives you some more options, so not every encounter is just another elemental. I feel like I've done so many videos on elementals now on this channel, by this point you should have plenty of options for that kind of thing. We've got all the para-elementals, undead elementals, now we've got archons, the other 4th edition elementals, and the omni-mental. I feel like I'm missing something, but I think that's all of them. So hopefully that should help flush out your kind of multiverse. The other thing to keep in mind too is these elementals are a lot smarter than just the classic elementals in the regular monster manual. So a group of archons might actually use maybe a fire elemental or a water elemental the same way a group of human soldiers would use like war dogs. But again, I know many people handle elementals very different in their campaigns. And I feel like almost no one sticks exactly to what is written in the book. But also, I shouldn't say that. There are a lot of us out there, so I'm sure there actually are several people who do that as well. Well, but again, I guess the whole thing, if you take anything away from this video, is just options. Anyways, that is all for today on this video. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed that and hopefully it didn't end up being too long. If you do like what I do here and you want to support the channel, please subscribe. I've got at least one new video every week. I've also got a Patreon. You can find the link to that below, as well as a Discord. So please join us on there and chat with other members of the community and myself. Also, one, th one last thing I want to throw out there too is the Elemental Archons, although we do have three different types for each one, except for Air Archons, aren't necessarily the be-all, end-all of Archons. If you want an Archon that specifically is more of an Archer archetype, just invent that. 
I think the most value we get from Archons is just not so much the mechanics of how they do battle, but is just kind of the whole world that they suggest. It's just a different way to look at the elementals that we might not have considered before. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. I appreciate it, and I will see you next week.